Today's show is brought to you by Cotswolds Outdoor, Cross Bikes, Garmin and Cumulus. Hello and welcome to We Need More Heroes. In the age of Donald Trump as president and Kim Kardashian, a role model for millions, it's easy to lose hope. But there are still brilliant people out there who can inspire us to live better. Join me, George Beasley, on a mission around the globe to find them. We Need More Heroes aims to inspire and guide ordinary people to live extraordinary lives. Visit weneedmoreheroes.co for show notes and more info. If you enjoy the episode, please leave us a review and rating on iTunes and subscribe if you'd like to hear more. Thanks for listening. Hello and welcome to another episode of We Need More Heroes. Really excited to be joined by my guest now, Louis-Philippe. He's an adventurer and done loads of really interesting, awesome, inspiring stuff, but I'll leave that to him to do a little bit of an intro. So can you just tell us a little bit about who you are and a quick bit of background? Uh, I'm Louis-Philippe Blanc. I was born in Belgium. I'm Belgian. Uh, I've done up to now in the last 10 years, uh, 15 expeditions. Uh, 10 are world first. Uh, I enjoy doing expeditions where there's uh, usually a purpose. Is it a record or is it uh, science or charity? And then my records, what I look like is for um, uh, terrains, areas that are seldom visited. So I'm, I would not be interested by... Um, very famous uh, icons like the Everest. I'm not interested. Basically, I could say I'm interested in something very new, uh, genuine, uh, because it's more interesting that you have to work to find a solution to to get there and to do the, the, the trekking if it's a, a long distance trek. So it's the additional challenge that you like from doing these less trodden paths or world firsts. Is that the thing that you like about it? The the additional challenge that you yeah, get. The, so there's, a, of course, a mental and physical challenge involved, but there's also the, the information that you have to look for, the, the solution. When, when If I compare again to Everest, the Everest is, we know ev everything about how to climb. We know what food we need to drink, how much water, how to deal with altitude. It's all organized. There is like, there's nothing, no one has done it before. We don't know. You take pieces of experience of different people, you try to combine them, and then you go, and then you... You you are I, I never know in advance if I'm gonna make it uh, to the end or, or alive, but the the idea is that I'm not this interested in expedition that I am 100% sure to succeed. Yeah, I would for call sure. it rather a trip, and that that I would do with friends. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I can see the additional power of doing something that doesn't have the fact that you might make it till the end it's a, it's much more compelling just knowing that it is a real challenge because you you may not make it and it's part of the definition of adventure uh, a few people say i've been on adventure or some people say i'm an adventure well to me in my definition they are, they're not adventure is the definition is an enterprise or an undertaking with risk and what is risk Risk is the measure of the probability that what you want to do will fail or succeed. So it's a ratio between zero, 100%. Mm. And the higher the chance of failing, the more risk, the more risk, the more adventure. Mm. Yeah, I really like that way of thinking about it, actually. And I don't think it's the definition that a lot of people use. For it's actually in the dictionary. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Actually in the, that's what people forget. It's I think it's... Because, of course, of the media and uh, the adventure tours. Here we are uh, in London at the, the travel show. And the way to market a hike to Machu Picchu or, or climb Kilimanjaro is called expedition tours, adventure tours, whatever. Uh, some have other names, but they try to use the word adventure expedition while it's not. You have your own personal, let's say, little adventure. There's a little bit of risk, but it's all very organized. And for some people, I think it's for it's not for everybody to do world firsts or to go off and do incredibly dangerous expeditions. And maybe they shouldn't use the word adventure. But I like that adventure has an appeal to a lot of people. And maybe they're doing things like just climbing Machu Picchu, which we both probably wouldn't say is an extreme adventure. But it can often open the door to more extreme things, especially because um, adventurous is still quite a sort of 
niche topic that not many people, it's a small group of people that do this kind of thing. You go to these events and you see the same sort of people, but it's quite nice that it's becoming a bit more mainstream and people are going from a beach holiday that's two weeks, then they might go instead trekking to Nepal for a few weeks. And then it's a, it's a nice transition to maybe more adventurous stuff in one day because it's not a good idea to just go off and do a world first until you have some kind of experience and that yes. kind of thing, right? The, the media and the times made that it's more, and people want to have more experiences in, let's say, in their normal holidays. They start to do trekking, kayaking, skiing. A last degree to the North Pole is, is still a very valid adventure because there's some risk. It's, it's organized again, but it's still an adventure. To me, Everest is still definitely an adventure, don't let me wrong. Um, and there are two, two side effects to that, good and bad. The bad thing is that you might have people completely inexperienced who have the money and go to something and then might not enjoy it because what we are selling with, of course, beautiful, beautiful images, like you could sell a, a beautiful image of Kilimanjaro with a nice sunset and so on, and then you don't have it. You you end up at high, you're in the mist, and you, you and, and it's freezing, and you forget to to tell the people it's going to be cold, and you're going to have pain at your feet, and, yeah. and you might sleep and hurt your knee, bleed a little bit, and you have the altitude, you might vomit. All these things are kind of diminished, and uh, the media is there to to decrease the value of this, that mm -hmm that it becomes mainstream. But the good thing of all these uh, adventure tours and people who want to go uh, to do small, small or big expeditions, the good value is that they're going to have a bigger interest in nature. And at the end, it's going to help for conservation. If more people love nature, they're not going to pollute it. Mm, for sure. And when you go out there to those places and you actually experience what it's like to be out in a rainforest in Brazil or whatever, and then you meet people firsthand who've been... Uh, impacted by that kind of thing, it really hits home. I think for us, when in the bit of traveling that we have done, it's that kind of thing where you've m met people who've been impacted by stuff that you're doing at home, like single use plastic and all of that kind of thing. And then you go to places and you realize how much worse the flooding is in these places for people who, like, like us who don't recycle or that kind of thing. And it makes it a lot more real for you. Yeah. Yeah. The, it's, it's a social thing. Um, you can only have the empathy if you have experienced beforehand something similar. So can we just go back into uh, before you got into adventure? Like how did you, can you just set the scene a little bit and then tell us about the transition for you into adventure? I was a regular guy and I believe I'm still a regular guy. Was born in a normal family, loving family. Uh, did my studies of engineering, went to school, high school, uh, studies, started working. So I actually, in Belgium, we we don't have many adventures. So it's not like you are inspired. Today, they, they, they watch Bear Grylls on TV or, or, or us or in, in nice documentaries. And of course, you are inspired, especially in Britain, which is the country in the world with with the most, uh, the, the largest market and the uh, the adventure world is is UK, is the UK, and especially London has perhaps 25% of the adventures uh, on the planet are in mm -hmm. London, and perhaps 5% are here today in, yeah. in this uh, building. Um, I wasn't inspired by anybody, and I I had my job at, at the bank at a certain time, and I had a mission to do in Singapore. I went to Singapore for four months, and someone was coming back from this mission. And he told me, uh, you have to do scuba diving. I'm like, what's scuba diving? To me, scuba diving at that time was like as extreme or as for elites, like going to Mars or to space. <laughs> and anyway, I went for it. I, I took the course so first in a class and then I went scuba diving. I loved it. And then I loved it so much that I, I, I did all the steps to dive master in a very, very short time. A uh, good thing when you're an engineer is that you, it clicks very well to understand things uh, very quickly. I believe that if one day I want to uh, become a pilot of uh, an airplane, whatever, I, I should be able to understand everything. And so from scuba diving, I was interested in Australia and the Great Barrier Reef. It was like, it's like the kingdom of the place to dive. nice, nice place uh, to, to go diving, unlimited uh, experiences, and left my job. And went traveling in 2004 for a whole year as a backpacker, and I toured around Australia, which was basically let's 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 call it my week routine was 
Dive a full day, rest and recharge the battery, save the photos on the hard drive, not yet on the internet because it was too slow, it was on the hard drive uh, by then. And then uh, visit a bit of cultural experiences, perhaps a, a day party, a night party out, and then uh, visiting a bit of museums and then doing a hike. And I started with the Lonely Planet book, Walking in Australia, very simple, the Blue Mountains, two hour hike, follow the path uh, you know, on, the, on, the, on the asphalt, macadam, very easy. Next day I did another one, it was a full day, and then the next day was like two days, oh, we had to camp, so I had my tent, and I did the Boy Scouts, so that, that was good, I can make a note, I know how to make a fire, the basic things, but the wilderness in Belgium is completely different than the wilderness in Australia. And after a year, uh, Australia, mainly Australia and New Zealand, I had clocked 100 dives and 2,000 kilometers walking in very different environments of Australia and New Zealand, from the alpine uh, terrain to deserts to more rainforests wow. and coastlines. A lot of experience in terrains and how it feels to put your feet there. And because I got trained doing these walks, I mean, I was kind of walking... 50, 60 kilometer of track hike per week, official tracks, right? Sometimes I got lost, so it was a 1K off track, which was very scary. And at the end, I was very fit, very trained. I I started eating cans as a start, and it was like pasta and muesli. So from being heavier, I started to become lighter because lighter allowed me to do, compared to the book of the walking uh, guide, I could do two days in one. If I'm lighter, I can do this easily. So my backpack is going to be lighter so I can see more scenery. And it has always been the objective of seeing more landscapes because it's, the planet is beautiful. If I can go, not faster, but if I can walk longer distance on a day, I'll see, let's say, double. So yeah. double bonus. And this is how I entered in the first expeditions that I want to do, which were unsupported because one, it's expensive to have support. It's very expensive if you, if you have a film crew. It's very expensive if you have a plane to drop food from or a helicopter, and it's a bit less expensive, but still if you have to rent a four-wheel drive and drop food or water along the way. So the, the idea was to take kind of long distance trekking and try to start with all my water and food, or in the deserts, find water in the way if, if there's a place. Do you, as a person, tend to always push things to the extreme, do you think? No, I, I don't think what I do is extreme in, in the sense of the definition. To me, the, the extreme thing is, uh, you know, like the Red Bull guys, everything like uh, wingsuit, diving, base jumping. Perhaps it's kind of stuff I, I'd love to test one day. It but not, not not as Not as a passion. It looks great because when we see these photos, but... The pleasure is very, very short. Yeah, two minutes. So wings for two, a lot three of training, minutes yeah. maximum for, for, uh, for the risk that's involved. If you have your passion, it's it's. But in some ways, that's why they love it. Oh, that's why I love it. They had they say they have this adrenaline rush, which I believe because adrenaline rush is uh, fast and extreme. I'm extreme in the way that what I do is long in in time. So when you are alone for a few days or weeks or even months, like I did with no human being around you, that extreme part is very, very mental. You cannot prepare like this. You you have to experience uh, by yourself first. You, the, the, I, I remember the first time I, I did 48 hours without seeing a human being. When I saw a human being, I screamed like, humans! And they looked at me like, it's this guy <laughs> saying it. And I was like so happy. I, I realized at the same time that I said it, it was like, like a massive uh, revelation that... Wow, I haven't seen humans. And I started thinking about it. When was the last time I haven't seen any human beings for 40 hours? And it never happened. It brings you with yourself into the nature, which, which is starting to keep, let's say, a bit of your humanity on the side and brings part of the, the animal, the human animal part of you, which is very interesting. The animal part and the sense of smell, hearing increases to... Uh, being able to uh, support better the pain and so on happens after roughly three weeks. That's what talking to specialists who do solo things, after three weeks, this kind of animal part kicks in. We have it in ourselves. We don't know it because we, we're surrounded by walls, electricity and so on, music, radio. But when when it's there and it happens and then you start to, to kind of almost smell like 
I won't say that I can smell water from three kilometers away, but there's a kind of feeling like you become part of this little universe, which is uh, the place you are in at that moment. It's very, very interesting, very, very rewarding, but, but at certain risks. It takes time to prepare, it takes some money to do, and potentially, if you need rescue, it might take time to arrive. If I'm bitten by a snake in the desert, and it's a snake where I have a few hours, I know that no one will save me. You mentioned how it brings out this animalistic side mm -hmm. in you, this almost instinctive will to survive, and you don't really have any distractions as well, so you're constantly w a lot more in touch with your senses. What other effects did it have on you mentally? Because not seeing somebody, we're used to seeing people every single day, so did, it, did you find it difficult to then not have anybody to talk to and you're essentially left alone with yourself mm -hmm. in a way that you're not normally? We have mechanism uh, embedded in our brain that helps us to uh, keep a little sense of social experience. Like I sing a lot in my head. Good songs, sometimes bad songs, like the last back's bad song that we would have heard. The song Stick With You of the Pussycat Dolls. <laughs> if you remember, yeah, you probably remember that song. Not a really good song, right? And just because I was walking with my walking sticks, and at that time I was thinking in English, I was like, where are my walking sticks? Walk, stick, stick. And I probably had heard the song a few days before in a plane or whatever, in the airport. And then Stick With You came in my brain, and it took hours and hours to get it out. It's okay. horrible to, to leave. You try to sing something better. I like to sing Green Day songs. But the thing is that other thing, if you have seen Castaway with Tom Hanks, he plays with, uh, I think, Wilson. William Wilson, Wilson the yeah. ball. So that we try to have a partner. We like to do, to make a, a business, of course, of an adventure to film ourselves. But it's a way to remove this part of stress because it's, it's stressful to be completely alone. And when you, you know you're going to be hungry, there's pain, there's cold, there's warm, there's any of these kind of bad thing that doesn't bring really pleasure, right? If some people say, I have pleasure to be uh, on top of the Everest where it's very cold. No, you don't have pleasure. Pleasure is perhaps at the end or when, yeah, pleasure when, when you back. see wild animals doing something and that you were like, like a child watching whatever bird singing brings you joy. But the, this loneliness, yeah, we, we try to talk to things and it's, it's not bad. The real bad things kicks in when you... Uh, physically are so tired with level of stress, uh, underfed with a, lo a lot of different types of vitamins that your brain starts to be completely, uh, uh, let's say, wrong. And it happened one time. Hopefully it will never happen again. And I got delirious. Not delirious after drinking, whatever. I got completely out of myself. I was in my tent. I started moving in my backpack. It was during the night. And I could not make the difference between dream and reality. I really thought I was in the bush. I was actually in Tasmania, pushing the bush on the sides to, to go between the, the trees and the branches. And I was actually in my backpack because I was so tired, completely exhausted, that my brain gave this information to me. And this might be actually very dangerous because certainly my brain might order me to go out of the tent, I don't know, naked in the snow, walk away of my tent, and then suddenly I, perhaps then I, I kick back in a stability because I, let's say I wake up and I, I, I am completely lost. I don't know where's my tent and then I die of hypothermia. Yeah, it's fascinating how just something like tiredness and lack of good nutrition can hit you so quickly. And it's so important, the stories that we tell ourselves, a bit like you were saying before, you sort of have to make companions out of things, whether it's talking to a camera or how Tom Hanks talks to Wilson. It reminded me of a story of a guy, he's a prisoner of war, and he was put into solitary confinements for seven years. And um, you can imagine what it's like the first day when you get in there and you think, what am I going to do? This is the worst type of torture to be removed from other people, which is, again, to your point, we're social creatures and we're used to having so much companionship that the worst thing that we can think to do to a prisoner is put them by themselves. Yes. The day, the day after this delirious time, I woke up and I had not enough food and I, I I was actually lost. My GPS was broken. The only way to guide, and I lost also my compass. And the cap, the, the maps were useless because you're basically in the forest. 
and it's cold. It's like the Amazon, but in cold. It's not very friendly places, the wilderness of Tasmania. And the only way to know where I am was to climb in trees and to look at the sea and go back in the trees and knowing that, okay, I felt that branch, is, that branch here that I can see here, the big one, is going towards the sea. I have to follow. And every kilometer or so, you have to climb another one to to try to minimize the time and find a river because the river goes to the sea. And then when you find a river, you know that following the river might help, but it's not always easy to follow just a river like this. To continue the story about the brain and so on, I, I, uh, we, are, uh, we were three basically to do it uh, twice. We worked with a psychologist, a scientist in Paris, and she was the only person in the world to uh, measure and test our brains, or cognitive, which means the thinking, while we are under stress in extreme environments. And I participated twice in her, in her studies. So I was her outdoor lab rat. And we had every four days a set of tests, like, like little games, like a Sudoku, but easier than that. <laughs> Uh, to do it, it took us about 45 minutes. Uh, there was also a questionnaire about how, how we feel about the night, have, how was the sleep, and you know, from one to five and so on. And there's one test, which is telling random letters, 100 random letters of the, of the alphabet, of course. So it could be A, Q, Z, R, C, B, Z, K, Z, P. Uh, I said a lot of Z there. Um, <laughs> the more random the letters, the better. When they are close, if suddenly I, side, I start to say A, B, C, oops, they are following, the, it's not good. So she measures our ability to focus on this task that is against the way we have been programmed since we are five, six years old, which is a very hard task on 100 letters. And while crossing Iceland, roughly in the middle, middle time on a 19-day expedition crossing, and these letters... I said suddenly seven, eight. After that, I said fuck <laughs> because I realized it. And then when I finished the test, I was like, wow, I have to say letters. And suddenly my brain said numbers. One day followed, seven and eight. But I said, how come I, I'm, I'm able suddenly to say that? It's not what I want. It's not the purpose of this exercise. And this is how you know that you are tired, that your brain actually is out, is tired, and that actually, I was at that time, if there's a scale from one to 10, and 10 is burnout, like could happen in an office, I was perhaps at eight or nine. Unfortunately, she stopped doing this test because it was hard for, us, for her to uh, find o other lab rats. But things that now smartphones arrived and uh, the idea this year, if I have time, I'll go to Paris to spend a weekend working on the film on how she counts the, say, the point and so on, how she measure this. And I'd like to make an app that we all explorers could use in, ex in expeditions. So it's very interesting. And I want to have this app coming, let's say, in 2018 that we can measure that could help perhaps to save the brain so it could help to save lives. If, if you know that you are very tired, you could potentially tell your boss, Boss, I'm tired. I'm going to work yeah. double hard next week, but give me two days off or two days I'm going to leave at 3 p.m. today. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. I know that they have developed something not quite like that, but for measuring tiredness for pilots. And they have to do a task after every X number of minutes because it tends to be tiredness and mistakes from pilots mm -hmm. that kill people. Just wondering, so you know how important it is to keep your stress levels down and to give your body what it needs to function well. But with... The mental aspect, is there any way that you found to increase your mental strength or any exercises? Or did she give recommend anything that you do to try and make you a little bit more resilient? No, uh, she didn't give anything. I think it's part of her brain. So it's in our DNA. Is there a way to train? I think the only way we can train is to, to feel the body, these little alarms that our, our body is, is giving us to stop before it's too late. You've, you've done these incredible expeditions. I'm sure people will listen and just be like, I would love to do that. It sounds like a real adventure, these kind of things. But what would you recommend for somebody who thinks, I'd love to go on a big adventure, but I don't have the skills that I need for map reading, all of this kind of stuff. What well, do you think is a good a way good to The good thing now, there's videos on YouTube where you can learn things, but a video on YouTube is not the same as, especially in our field, which is being outdoors. Just go out. 
if if you've never been to the Boy Scouts, start camping in the woods outside London if you're in London, or go to Scotland. It's perfect uh, terrain for little adventure and training because it's wet. You're miserable when you're wet and cold. You're gonna learn, you know, these these kind of things. Um, and of course, if you want to go on a fast track, yeah, start with hiking and then take a, a course or a touring guide to Kilimanjaro, climb that one first, go to Mont Blanc, go to Mont Elbrus, and then in six months to a year, you be normally very fit enough if you, you have to train. That's the, the part in, in alpinism. You could go to Anconcagua, and at the same time, when you're home, you do a bit of climbing, ice, you take a course. It costs money, but you, well, Everest costs money. But from zero to two years, anybody reasonably fit with a good DNA with, you know, two legs and two arms, it's normally rather possible for anyone to. If we're into deserts, normally, hopefully next year, uh, I'm going to start bringing people who want to go with me in the Simpson Desert in Australia. Uh, this desert is uh, the size of England, so it's pretty decent. Uh, and the idea is to bring a group. It would be me, five other people, not more, so six people, holding their cards slowly. A desert ha has to be crossed slowly with a motorcycle or thing. You, you cannot see on the ground the, the flowers, the beautiful flowers, the tens of colors, uh, the red sand dunes, you, you, you well, it, I asked NASA actually uh, to give me the top five deserts on Earth that, that were more the lookalikes of Mars, and the, the, the closest of the terrain. And the second question I asked, what was like the best terrain to train for Mars on Earth? And she said, same answer. I don't know, I haven't been to. But anyway, any deserts I believe would be the Atacama in Chile or Simpson are really, really good training fields. Actually, NASA also trained people uh, in the Simpson Desert in 2002 uh, to test them. And so it's a very good training. It doesn't mean that if you go with me, you're going to be to Mars in 10 years. <laughs> but um, a little bit closer. It could be a little bit uh, of the feeling of remoteness and not knowing things, especially because that not many films... Uh, I mean, I haven't actually released my film yet. It's not even edited. Uh, because I want to go back to Simpson another time with a draw now and um, play scenes where I'm going to hold my cart in the sand with the drone to have nicer images. And with that, I'm, I can finally, hopefully, in hopefully for the 10 years. So it would be, oh shit, it's already next year, 2018. <laughs> I can release the film uh, because there's no film yet of except the one from Red Bull that's going to come out this year normally. There's no film yet on uh, crossing the the Simpson Desert. There's many films on Everest, but of course it's I think six, seven. I think we're near seven thousand people now who have climbed Everest, and it's remote, but it's very still not that not so remote now because they have a helicopter that can bring you or rescue people to camp two, or even camp three or four sometimes. So it's very remote, very rewarding because it's slow. And there's no danger of an avalanche. The, the only danger is twisting your ankle, but basically it's sand. So what is it that that draws you to it then? The ple the actual experience, as you said before, is not particularly pleasant, or a lot of it is not pleasant. You When you see these wildflowers and, and see these uh, animals, then you get some joy, but mainly it's it's hard grinding. So what is it that you that draws you to these adventures like yeah, this, especially in the desert where it's, it's so barren? It's a very good question. It's like basically why do we do what we do? And my first reason why I go to a place is I go for the landscapes because it is not sure you're going to see a nice animal. Is it a lizard, a kangaroo, whatever? They can be there. You can see 100 in a day or zero during 10 days. But landscapes are there and they're beautiful. And these rewards for the moment for me, are higher than, uh, we can use the word suffering sometimes, especially the first days where your body needs to uh, get accustomed to the kind of routine of this walk and doesn't know, and the, you know, the friction on the backpack and so on. So there are definitely rewards. I wouldn't do it if it was completely pain. Like, like if uh, the Simpson Desert was actually cold, like in Antarctica at minus 40 in a whiteout and there's nothing to see, I wouldn't go. Because it would be just walking for walking and doing a record distance. I'm not interesting. 
I'm not uh, sorry. I'm not interested at all. Actually, I'm interested in in the very hardcore and. Someone will do it in the next 10 years. No one has been to the um, South Pole in the winter. It's a very appealing challenge. It's a uh, complete madness because I believe rescue is not possible. No helicopter in minus 40 with the wind. And the funny thing is, you know, somebody sitting at home just thinking, I can't wait to do that. Maybe this is the oh, year. There, like there's some people, people love probably that. preparing it. I mean, Iran finds tried with the... but. I would say the the old way and the, the new ways is always kind of unsupported, you know, alone and so on these kind of records. But before this, you always have the machines, basically petrol. And when he went and made this attempt, there were I don't know how many tractors with these um, well cells where they can live completely sheltered. I think there were four or five. So it's it's a massive undertaking. It's a few millions, I believe. And uh, and ten or twelve people there, and but basically it's trying to go in the complete darkness, driving slowly. Um, I think two people were actually uh, walking in front because they were lighter, and they had sensors in the skis or something to detect crevasses because you don't want your uh, fuel supply or your food supply go into a crevasse. You better have a human that's attached to the. 15 or 20 meters behind uh, with a rope that might fall and then you're okay. We'll what put, job? We'll put you out. Yeah, what <laughs> job? It's like you, you're the, you completely, uh, the, the white out lab rat. You, yeah. You're like the, it's, it's like a minefield actually. Yeah. You, 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 you're a guy that don't want to step on the mine, which is falling into crevasse. It's so fascinating what draws people to do that and how people are so different as well. Well, th th there's this part of ego, of course, it's, it's always there. Uh, it, my first expedition, no one heard about it, and I I know a few people who do expeditions that are like way above what what we see. Just more, I mean, let's say more difficult or more risky than climbing Everest. We never hear about it because they just do it for themselves. They do it. They don't even blog about it. They take a few photos. They share one on Facebook, and that's it. The, the, uh, it's healthy and unhealthy. We have to do it if we want to live from it, and if we, or, or if we want in my case for my moment is like trying to find let's say sponsors or attention to decrease the cost of an expedition the first thing is, is let's say get our risky holiday for free that's the, like the the first step and then of course living from it getting the whole thing paid and living from it and then potentially some people most famous is Bear Grylls now who, who who's a millionaire because of what he did he hasn't done many big hardcore expeditions but uh, he managed his uh, career as an outdoor star, let's say, very well. He's very successful successful in this. Yeah, and he gets a lot of shit from people, particularly people who don't do expeditions, when they found out that he was staying in hotels some nights when he was filming. But yep. he still he still was like served in the British military, and he still does some difficult stuff and he goes yeah. out there and he, he eats he's not all of a, that gross food sometimes he's certainly he not be a an actor but he's not an actor of course he acts in his shows his yeah. shows are complete it's complete acting yeah. i mean the, i think in up. the first episode of man vs wild or if it was the name of the show there's a bear running behind him after him and actually it's a man and a bear it's very hard to ask a bear to run after you so that's a little bit hard, but it's it's entertainment. I mean, it's show business. It's entertainment. He does it well. I would say seriously, people. What did you think that he would do all these three, four, five days? We don't know how. You know, it feels like it's a two or three day trip. Well, he's probably there a week. Do you really also believe he knows everything like this out of nothing of all he all the thing he teaches? No, there's a specialist who is showing the skill. And he, he does it over. That's how you learn. And so he's an adventurer, but he's, uh, if there was a scale of risks he took, is fairly low. Looking back at your adventures that you've done, you've done lots of big ones and some firsts. Which one are you most pleased with? I talked about the Simpson Desert. So this was like the main thing that I did uh, eight years ago in 2008. Well, actually almost nine years ago. Um, crossing from north to south. No one had any clue that it was possible. And there's a French expression that says, Ils ont réussi parce qu'ils ne savaient pas que c'était impossible, which means they succeeded because they did not know it was impossible. No single Australian, and there's a lot of adventurers in Australia, thought 
about attempting the length of, of the Simpson death because it's simply, for them, it was simply impossible. And second was uh, touring Lake Titicaca uh, by kayak done with Gadiel Sanchez Rivera, uh, known here by Cho, which was the, the guide of uh, Ed Stafford uh, walking down the Amazon. Uh, and uh, that was funny because I, I was on Facebook and I was like, I don't want to, I really wanted to circumnavigate the lake very close to the shore to, to see it very well. And I, I was like, I don't want to do it alone. It's it's a supported expedition. So it's easier to do go and support it usually alone because you don't have to wait for somebody or someone stronger doesn't have to wait for you. If you're two and you're sick, like in Antarctica, someone will be sick, you have to wait because you're sick and you lose, you lose a bit of this momentum. It's not super efficient. But it's way safer because if someone collapsed, the other one can pick up the satellite phone, of course. So I I didn't know his email, but I Facebooked him and took him a while to reply because the internet in Peru is, uh, is an issue. And I uh, said, basically, um, I want to go circumnavigating with a CAC Lake Titicaca. Is this something you'd like to go with me on the expedition? And he said, oh, yes, what's a kayak? <laughs> <laughs> And um, and it was it was okay because when we got there, we I, I was in a in a year off, and I was eight months at the time in South America. So I, I uh, during the the first five six days, so first week, I trained him on kayaking. I, I teach him what move, movements we needed to use, and he came along, and that was the best expedition ever because I knew he would be able to sustain in pain, difficulty tartness he could push hard and so on and he was a fast learner and he was great and he was better in spanish than me obviously which which is an add-on and we were both at that time well he's not you know super famous i'm not famous uh i was a bit jealous when when two tourists came on the on the boat where we had a free accommodation on the boat and they were from britain and they were preparing say yeah, i'm there with the you know he's uh, the guy from and they were like oh cho cho he's like <laughs> They, they recognize him from the from the book and the TV. I'm like, yeah, I've never been on TV and in, in my own films, but hopefully next year. And um, yeah, the, it, it was good for him because he said, wow, people have seen me really in Britain and they recognize me from, from TV. Yeah. Uh, and that was actually, yeah, super expedition because we were two, we were seeing people. There was not too much of a rush to finish in time. There was no time. Yeah, he was, we still can navigate the lake. And we, t- we took, points and GPS points, we actually created the first street view the, of the lake. But not continuous street view, it was like a point every mile or so with one or two photos that we know that at that point is this type of landscape. And actually we got uh, one of the explorers flag fr- uh, from the Explorers Club uh, with us because there was science uh, bonded to this expedition. So uh, the first uh, together that we w- that we held and that's that we are very proud because uh, the definition of an adventurer is someone who takes basically risks, while an explorer, there are two types of explorers. The explorer that actually goes to really unknown ground, ground that no one human beings have been there, and then the explorer that is also a scientist in a field. You could be an explorer in Borneo studying insects and um, butterflies for a whole month, while actually you are completely sheltered with a fridge and beers, but you're an explorer because you explore new terrain. And the definition that the Explorer Club, the Explorers Club uh, gives is that you come back with scientific knowledge. And that's the difference between two. And I'm both. So I've done expeditions where I'm completely an adventure, risks and no science. I've done expeditions that was purely science and beers every night and music and, and so on on a completely remote island. And then in between like this one and like Titka, which is the best because you have a, a little bit of, the, a bit of this physical challenge with some risks. I'm not going to reveal a few things that happened on the lake. That's <laughs> for the film. And I really want to make that film because it was a very, it was an awesome trip. So first, um, we did this expedition in the winter because in the winter, it's colder, obviously. If it's cold, there's not too much sun to come. So there's, the days are shorter, one. And because of there's less heat, there's less evaporation. Less evaporation means less clouds, means less rain. And in a kayak, you don't want wind and rain. If you're wet with the wind, 
it's freezing, you don't want that. If you fall in the water, it's finished. You're going to hypothermia and probably die from the shock and so on. So when you, when you have this, you don't want to fall in the water. So good thing we're always near the shore. Thing is, a storm started. Lightnings, storm, big waves. And it took us three hours. And so the last, more or less, two last hours or last hour and a half, we were in big waves, cold wind pushing us towards the cliffs. We could not see each other. We were even 10 meters apart. We could not see each other. So every single 30 seconds, I was screaming, Gadiel, that's his real name. I don't call him by Cho. Gadiel. And he was saying, see, just to know that he was not in the water. Because I knew that if someone of us was in the water, the only thing was to leave the kayak, swim to the cliff, which we couldn't see, but hear by the waves crushing, and try to climb on the rocks if there were any rocks, because there meant that potentially the second person had to go to rocks if he could, because we don't want the second person to be smashed with a kayak on the on the rocks that we, we, we don't see, and it's slippery and so on. We, we have no idea of the terrain. And yeah, it's, so it's, it's very cold, it's windy, you have no idea where you are and you don't even have the luxury because of the waves because you don't want to fall into the water to take a GPS to know where you are or, or and certainly not film and get the GoPro out. I think I, I, I was second, I have perhaps a few seconds that I took the GoPro out uh, uh, between the two. So you don't know where you are, you don't know where to stop and you're like, do we continue or do we go back? Because we are probably not progressing because the wind was pushing us, but we might be there in 10 minutes. And whatever, we continued. And at a certain time, I decided, okay, I have, after like, yeah, really three hours, I uh, I decided to take the risk and take my GPS out to check where we were. And it was like, in front of us was like still the lake. And we were actually following the bay We for a few meters. We were like, we were like there. And we only had to turn right and do... 300 meters with actually the wind pushing us very easily. It was easier. The wind was pushing us towards actually nice beach. And actually what happens that every night we decided who was going to be to the beach first to get wet because the one, the, the first person going in, in, uh, in the water will have to put the two feet out of the kayak in the water, hold his own kayak, waiting for the second one to arrive, go in the water so he could pull the second one further on the sand and the second person would not have wet feet, so warmer, and would be able to pitch the tent or or, or, or make dinner. So it was the kind of a routine we, we decided. So it was my turn that day. I, I, I was the leader of this expedition, and I said uh, it was my turn. But very happy I took the G, otherwise we, 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 we saw nothing. But when we got into the bay, we saw a few lights of houses, But and that's very scary, because during two hours, you only know one thing. If you fall in the water, there's... 80% chance of dying of hypotonia or being smashed on the rocks. And it's very, very scary. <laughs> it sounds like a real adventure, though. And like and, you were uh, saying, where you're 100% there, like your body and mind are required to be completely present. And it reminds me of um, a Theroux quote. And he says, I went to the woods to live deliberately. So when you're in your super safe Western style life at home, it doesn't really matter what you do. You're going to be fine. There's no danger. You don't have to be present with your day. You can just wake up. The food's there. You could watch TV all day if you want. Maybe go out, have a few beers and you come home. But you don't have to really think or interact with the experiences in your life. Whereas when you're on expedition or in his case, when he went to live in the woods, you have to be so present. Everything matters what you do because if you aren't paying attention, then you missed that place. You didn't get your GPS out because you weren't thinking. And so you just kept going and then you 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 died. But have been died yeah. five minutes later. Yeah. Both of us. So have you got your eyes on any big adventures at the moment? Or do you know what you're hoping to do next? Well, I have a list of like 30 uh, on, well, on paper. <laughs> In a notepad file, there's a list of 20 or 30, something like this. Uh, in 2017, so this year, there's going to be nothing. Uh, this year, I'm really focusing on trying to monetize with pay talks. Um, 
the, what I did in the past 10 years. Also spend time because now I have a, a day job. I work in a startup that has a lot of money. It's not that I receive that money, but I receive enough that I, I want to hire people to edit the films because with films that are more seen, I can come to festivals mm -hmm. and so on. Later on, perhaps a book um, and so on. If, if you could, would you choose to just do adventure as your full-time career or do you like 100%, having that separation? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yes. It's uh it's well, I wouldn't be here. Oh, I love to be here because you know, I, I, I do it's promotion today. This talk even is a bit of promotion, and, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I like talking. And I believe you feel that, and the audience, <laughs> hello, I hope you feel that too. Um, but again, we are animals, human beings, and of course, we are not made to be in front of a computer eight hours per day and then get home and then be in front of TV. I'm, I'm exaggerating. It's not everyone has that, that life. Um, and we evolved like this, which is a good thing because it brings us very interesting things. I mean, people working on technology can make, I mean, surgeons and all these kind of stuff can save people finding diseases, surgery and stuff. If, if we're still at the time of the just invented fire, and we, we, we are more, Lucky to live now that fi than 500 years ago, no, no doubt about it. Um, but yeah, I think there's, and I'm, I'm not the first to say it, and some people are probably saying this for the past 100 years now, there's an appeal, and I think it's, it's now more than an appeal, it's a common consciousness that we have to go, I would say, go back simply to the woods, go back to nature. We must do that. It's the way we can... Digital detox. We we need this, especially now with our smartphones. And so we need these moments where we, we say, "I'm gonna get off. I turn on the Wi-Fi this weekend, and I'm gonna go at least for hours walking in a park or whatever. No TV, no whatever." And my own detox is, of course, my expeditions because I have absolutely nothing for weeks. Uh, but I try to do it now in Brussels as well because, especially this year, I'm gonna be basically ten hours per day in an office, and then. The evenings, what I do the next six hours, let's say after work, is that I'm working on expeditions or projects or the projects, which is basically emails, learning, uh, doing things again on the computer. So I'm like 14 to 16 hours per day on the computer, and I really have to get out sometimes, otherwise I'm gonna be mad. But but I know that at the end there's this purpose because uh, you know I'm gonna be doing another expeditions, and I've done a lot of deserts in the past 10 years, and now I'm going more to um. The, the aim is to go towards very cold places and, and winter expeditions like um, uh, one that I announced like a few years ago, but I still don't have the money. It's really money. I need to train, but to, to train, you need to take some like three months off that you can really physically train for that. Uh, no one has crossed Iceland in the winter from coast to coast and supported, which is very hard. Uh, four Brits uh, made an attempt last year. Uh, unfortunately, the Kind of, depends on how you define rescue, but they got rescued three times. I mean, let's say three times they had to stop on the way or change plans, let's say. It didn't really go as planned because Iceland is hard. It's smaller than Greenland or Antarctica, but the winds, there are more freaking storms because you're so close to sea and fucking middle of the Atlantic <laughs> and north. <laughs> so it's, it's not a good place to be in the winter where it's mainly dark and so on. And the rescue doesn't really like to rescue people. So, but I think it's very important if you're young, I mean, like, like these four, um, young, young, uh, adventurers did. Uh, trying to attempt Iceland was a very good move because they got a lot of attention, bad attention because they failed so many times and in, in, in three, four weeks. Um, and they got backlashed by the media, especially in Iceland and so on, because they were young and prepared and so on. And it's very hard to prepare against two or three storms. And they said, yeah, we had like two big storms or two the biggest storms in the last 10 years. Yeah, but if you should know that these storms exist. Even if it's only one time per 10 year, you should consider they exist. In all of my expeditions that I do, I have to consider that rescue doesn't exist. When I mean unsupported, I have to imagine that I am the only person on the whole planet and that if I have to auto-rescue myself, that I'm able to do something. 
And of course, I have a distressed beacon and a satellite phone, not always a uh, last expedition. I didn't take any of this uh, safety equipment because I knew that in the desert, it was on the Bolivian salt flats, mm -hmm. Uyuni and Coipasa, the two largest salt, salt flats on the planet. I, I knew that if I would collapse because of the heat, uh, overheating, I would die because when you're alone, you're not able to call anybody. So wh what the, what's the point of carrying 300 grams extra plus 200 grams for this? Like 500 grams, I better convert that in water and drink a little more. And uh, it happened well. <laughs> it, it was actually my second attempt. So failure, I, I've had failures as well. I failed on that one three years ago. But the failures and also... My own mistakes, I really did mistakes in the preparation, helped me to succeed in the last three expeditions that I'm going to talk tomorrow morning, uh, tomorrow afternoon about. Yeah, looking forward to hearing about it. And just something that to sort of change tack a little bit, but when I was probing at the, you still have your day job and do you want to make adventure your mm -hmm. living is, there's a paradigm now where a lot of people have sort of woken up and realized they want a bit more of life. And there's a huge paradigm shift where people are trying to build a life that they love they're not just going to work to earn a paycheck mm -hmm. they want to have this reach self-actualization on Mas maslow's hierarchy of needs and they want all of these things they want to be passionate they want to make an impact all of this kind of stuff and we didn't used to want that from our jobs it used to be you went to earn money to put uh, food on the table yeah. and school you, job pension yeah die. that yeah. was the idea and and there wasn't really the opportunity to transcend class in the same way that we have now particularly in britain if you were a cobbler a couple of hundred years ago then you would stay as that whereas now we really do have the opportunity to almost do anything you want with within sort of bounds but that also comes in sort of a paradoxical, it's like the paradox of choice. It makes you then, if you're not doing something exceptional, it makes you sometimes think that there's something wrong with you because you do have the opportunity to do brilliant things. And a lot of people who aren't, I think they feel pressure on themselves that they're not making the most of this. Why aren't they making it? And so people are trying to build these lives they love. And there's a big bit of advice that you hear all the time called follow your passion. And it's something that I'm very torn over because people who do is it people who I see particularly here adventurers who've made it and they've they love adventure and they've made a life out of it and it's what they do they love it but for so many people to tell them follow your passion I think is in some ways the worst advice you could give them because it can turn your what you loved into your job and so you may end up losing your passion for it because it becomes work instead of play but also more than that, sometimes it means people who don't really have any aptitude for something go and follow a career that they'll never really get good at. And it's... It might be my case because for the moment I'm not making really money. I I, I absolutely, I mean, I, I need a, I have actually two jobs. <laughs> yeah. And some of my friends, they even tell me, you are not an adventure. Like, where do you get more your money from? I'm like, well, from from consultancy in IT, is like, yeah, but so your, your adventure is like a passion, it's your holidays, and so, so come on, and I always say, no, it's not holiday, you know, you don't go on holiday knowing you die, <laughs> and so, like, I have this day job, I mean, my day job, and, and I like my day job, hopefully, for the moment, it's, it's, it's good, and it's very hard, and I completely agree that we are giving... Uh, this inspiration and we say everything is possible. Go for it and make your first step, make your first move. And I love uh, Dave, say yes more. So say go yes and do it. And of, even I, if I completely agree on the philosophy of Dave and, and, and I, I will tell as well and so on, and I completely agree with it. Unfortunately, it's not for everyone. If I take for the rich countries like us, yes, it's, let's say, possible for... 50 or 90 percent of us it's certainly not possible in africa they first have to find water and food and shelter the basic survival things they are survival we are more than survival because basically we are bored and we have to find i, I could say that i'm i have my job i'm bored and i have to for my ego to feel good my happiness might be actually like this interview might be this happiness because i get attention and it's very hard i don't i don't know myself now if my happiness is because of the too little attention i get or if i really enjoy doing these things and i'm pretty sure 
400 that I really enjoy doing my expeditions because I had no attention before. And the risk is, like, like I said today, is that um, some people now, because they're so inspired and they see Bear Grylls and they want to, you know, you want to be on TV because, or you want to be in Big Brother or you want to be a soccer player because then you get the fame, you get the beautiful girls, the cars, the, the money and so on. And you all dream of that. And who's dreaming of being a, a cleaner of the toilets? It's a very decent job because if no one is doing it, it pisses off everybody else. Yeah, It's a very decent job. But it, no one dreams about that. We are dreaming of what we see on TV, these upper class jobs, which is which are fun, basically. Like, like you said, some people might have not enough money and not the money to do it because I believe that we... And it's a bit the same thing in startups. Not it's not my startup where I work. It's a startup of someone else. But they found out that like the startups like Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, Snapchat, uh, and so, so yes, yeah, Snapchat and so on, they could afford to take the risks of working for a year or two without being paid and trying to get money of the investors, because they had a backup plan. Not that they had a plan, but they had a backup stop, which is basically they were rich at the start. They have their parents who had money. And I'm not rich, but my parents have enough money that they could pay me for a yeah. year while if I struggle to find a job for, well, my parents, we, we, we make furniture. So well, like I did when I was 12 years old, I was, you know, counting the, the screws because the screw was a lot of value. So I was sorting screws, cleaning up the mess and so on. The, so I was helping in the, in the furniture, of, well, not the factory, it's very small workshop. And... So I, I could, and I'm an engineer, so I can still help him. So I have, this is my very last backup plan. And now I have three degrees, three masters. I speak four languages. Normally I should be always able to find a decent job. Uh, it's not the case for everybody. So there's risks. Of course, some people have kids. Uh, it's way harder. I have two friends. Uh, there were two adventures. I put them together. They're happy. They're married. They have two kids. But now they do less adventures. <laughs> they're waiting for the kids to grow a bit older. Uh, so it's a bit harder. It's like they, they 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 feel this frustration, and then you have I'm sorry to say you have people who are just not simply smart enough to get surrounded with a good network. My network is not good, but it get better over it gets better over the years because I what I do I'm I'm very good in in few days and I get the, uh, some attention, and some people are simply not let's say smart enough to be able to. I don't know, read the map properly or, or they have the tendency to put themselves in really bad situations. Like you, you, I potentially could cycle from Alaska to Ushuaia in six to nine months and be robbed one time and you'll have these people who attract this kind of bad luck because they are not aware. They had, it's not smart in, in the school way, right? You could have an MBA but you're just not have this part of the brain that makes you smart that you get robbed uh, at the airport and you get your your bike already robbed because you don't pay attention because you, I I don't know it's yeah it's really interesting that you say that I, um, so we're actually yeah cycling from Alaska to Argentina oh, uh, wow. in in May um, oh you're starting so, yeah yeah so hopefully we won't have too many you probably and cross robberies. Uh, a French girl I know she said she was taking ten years off to walk around the globe. So she started in France, she walked to Russia and she's biking. I don't know if she's gonna bike to Ushuaia, the whole thing, because it can be done by next summer. So in six months, but perhaps she'll, yeah. in the end, she'll well, go back to walking an and you might, I, well, well, I'll change emails and stuff. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's uh, So we, we, um, we met in Thailand when we were both traveling, but then we went to South America and I was in, in Brazil for six weeks and I used to be really into Brazilian jiu-jitsu and Thai boxing. And that was the thing that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I sort of had this aspiration to make it as a fighter, but by then that was like my dream. But I was in Brazil anyway, training, um, training Brazilian jiu-jitsu in these brilliant schools. And it's so big over there. Like they, in the pub, they will lock the doors. The grandmas are there. They know everybody in the UFC, in the cage fighting organizations. Everybody knows who's fighting. Whereas here it's a very, it's becoming more popular now, but most old Small ladies wouldn't know. Yeah. So it's, it's huge there. It's like a religion and I was walking around every day in a okay area. It wasn't super dodgy, but it also wasn't the safest area in Rio. 
And um, I was wearing my little MMA pants, you know, those tiny little underpants that they wear. So I was walking around in those and I never had any trouble. And I think it's because people just thought that I must be some kind of good international fighter, even though I wasn't. Um, and so I never had any trouble. And also um, we've done a bit of traveling, so we're a, a bit streetwise. Um, and we was, I was staying in this hostel and a couple came and they were an English couple. And the guy was a couple of years younger than me. He was like 24 with his girlfriend. And he was a, a lovely guy, but really nerdy. And you could tell he had no common sense, like no, he wasn't streetwise at all. And I was just thinking, I know people like that. I don't think you're going to last very they long would here. would say the toaster doesn't work and check around for 20 minutes well, actually, the plug is not in, in exactly. there. And it's just in yeah. front of the eyes. They just yeah. don't realize. And like, and you could see that these guys, they they were, they looked like they'd never really left England. And they were super pasty. So it was obvious that they were foreign. And they, they just got off their flight and they'd got into our, into our hostel. And they were just like, oh, we're starving. Is there anywhere that we can go and grab some food? I said, yeah, it's just down the street, down there, turn left. There's a big supermarket. So I was just sitting in the reception. And then they came back like two hours later. And they looked really disheveled. And I was just like, you, you guys okay? They and got they're lost. Just like, yeah, we got, we got robbed. Two streets. Oh, robbed. And I was just like, really? It's, it's literally just there. And they were just like, yeah, we walked outside and there's some 14-year-old guys. And he had his camera and his, and his money, his passport. She had hers. And they were like 14-year-old dudes and they just have a, a blade up their arm. And they just go over to tourists who look like they're... They're clueless. Like they shouldn't be there. Yeah, they look a bit clueless and they went up to them and did the right thing. They said, give me all your money. And they, and they said, yeah, okay, fine. There's a group of five or six 14-year-old boys from Rio, from the favelas. And so they gave them everything. And you could, you, there's just something about them that if you are a little bit more streetwise, they stick out to you. So to the locals, then you can see uh, you don't stand any chance. Uh, and yeah, it's it's really interesting. Like he was, uh, he worked in IT. He was a clever dude, but just didn't have that part. He hadn't yeah. got that type of intelligence. And part of experience, but there's also this part. What I believe, I might be wrong. Uh, I only have one life to, <laughs> and I've probably crossed in my life one hundred thousand human beings, not talk to them. But like I said, there's things they're gonna learn. That's a learning experience. Yeah, I've got robbed a, a few times. Happens. Uh, so you learn it and then you you learn to avoid it but then there's this common sense and this this common sense that some people will never have yeah for sure so you've got a few your eye on a few adventures and uh it's it's been really interesting to hear about them and thank you so much for taking the time and uh where can people learn more about your adventures or if they want to check you oh, out they, just my my website is a good start uh Better on a on a on a laptop or PC than than on your browser because uh, then you can see also the the Facebook things. Uh -huh. On Facebook, I I like to put more easy stuff. You know, they're easy to post. And then the coming days, I'm gonna put um, actually first time I'm, I actually innovated in that that I'm the first let's say solo explorer to take 360 degree cameras with me. Oh, cool. And I took them in the last two expeditions in the Simpson Desert and the Solaris of Bolivia. And the images are stunning because you are wow. really with me. And the idea is to put the link into the KML, so the Google Earth file, that you're going to see my path and some icons. Every icon is basically a, a point I'm taking every two or three kilometers. And there's another color. Usually I put a, a pink camera. You click on it, you have the link. You click on the link and you, you are immersed in 360 degree photo that is 100 megapixels so you can zoom. And wow, in. that's incredible. What a and cool then, idea. So your website is? Uh, www.louisphilippelonk.com. If you cannot spell my name, which I completely understand, look for Belgian Adventure in Google. You're going to find me. That's how I found it. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll, I'll also link to it in the show notes. So thank you again so much. It's been awesome to hear about you and uh, look forward to chatting again soon. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. There we have it. I hope you enjoyed this one. If you did, spread the love and share it with anyone you think would also benefit from it by sharing it on Facebook or Twitter with the hashtag We Need More Heroes. Connect with me on Facebook and Instagram at We Need More Heroes and just more underscore heroes on Twitter. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this and in fact any of our other episodes. So get in touch at we need more heroes.co. Thanks so much for tuning in and sharing the love. And thank you again to today's sponsors, Cotswolds Outdoor, Cross Bikes, Garmin and Cumulus for making this show happen. You've heard the magic. 
Now do something with it and be the hero in your own story. 